Hi, it's Gabla Baby for Ari of OSNST Limited, and I just wanted to do a vlog before I go to sleep, something that's been playing in my mind. If those of you who saw on YouTube or on Instagram recently, uh, I think it was UB1, UB2's uh, IG account, um, it was about an attempted suicide at the Southwell train station in Eden Borough, Middlesex. Um, it was very disturbing, very disturbing, very shocking. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. Um, I felt for many, many years very suicidal. So in this blog, I'm just going to share my experience and why I believe assisted dying, assisted suicide, euthanasia has to be legalised in Great Britain. And I'll share my reasons and why I've come to this conclusion. Now, if anyone knew me before I became mentally unwell, I was about 19 years old when I had a breakdown, 36 years old now. Um, the life I used to live, the friends I used to have and where I used to work in Kingston, uh, I was just having such a fun time. So to have a breakdown and for many years refusing medication and then being medicated when I was about 28, 29, um, I started feeling side effects and started been sedated, always and always asleep. I'd spend at least 23 hours a day in bed for at least three or four years. That was due to because I was very sedated, um, very drowsy, and I'd just wake up, use the toilet, have something to eat, and go back to bed. I was in bed for many, many years. I used to be quite handsome when I was younger, and then I lost my looks, which I found very difficult to cope with. Uh, is it vanity? Yeah, it is vanity, but it's not as easy as that. When you're very used to looking a certain way and you no longer look that way and you don't get the attention you used to want to get, it was very, very hard to come to terms with. So I started feeling very, very suicidal for many years. Now, I broke down to my mum and my sister and I told them how I was feeling. My sister gave me a hug. She goes, you know, you know, just to reassure me. And I told the mental health services in um, in Middlesex South or the, Ealing, the uh, West London Mental Health Trust uh, when I spoke to them and they contacted the home, home treatment team uh, because my care coordinator was concerned and I just said to them, look, I feel like killing myself. I just find it difficult to, to carry on. Now, you need to understand, when you are in a, a boxed room, a small room, for hours and hours a day, at least 20 hours a day, you have no more friends. You don't have a social life. Your family don't know how to come to terms with how to deal with you because they're not professionally trained how to cope with someone who's got... It's, cause on, it's unfair on the family to just suddenly be put in this position where someone used to be a certain way, now they're another way, and no one's explained to them how to handle it, how to care, how to c c cope with what the, the sudden change. It's, just, it's all over the place. To have a certain life where it was full, active, eventful and fun to suddenly just being in a room, sitting in the corner naked, rocking back and forth and just wanting to get out the, the, the mess the body had come to because I gained a lot of weight, I had dark rings beneath my eyes um, and I just wanted to end my life. I couldn't cope with just being in a box in my room all day, every day. And I would go online, there was a website, an American website that was, it was well, for suicide. If you want to kill your life, it told you ways to do it. And I was looking online. Uh, I wanted to jump in front of a train. I just wanted to get it over and done with quick, very quickly. I just, I, it, the thought would go from my mind of just wanting to jump in front of a train. Uh, and I remember going to the mental health team came to see me at home and they'd visit me uh, every day at certain times of the day just talk to me the same questions and things over and over again just they assess are you a risk to yourself are you a risk to others so one of the very nice I can't say his name but he was a very nice uh, home treatment team from West London Mental Health Trust Eden Hospital and he said to me you know he goes Govinda you did the right thing you know so many feel suicidal but they don't tell anyone they don't tell anyone how they're feeling they just go and do something silly. I did the right thing by telling them, look, I'm feeling a certain way where I want to end my life. So they would give me observation and, you know, things like that. 
and I would want to jump in front of a train. I, would, I, I remember I was sitting and talking to my psychiatrist and he, I said to him, look, I feel like just jumping in front of a train. He goes, do you feel, are, do you, are you intending on doing this? I, go, I don't intend on doing this, but it's just something that's going through my mind that I would want to do, just stop this all and get it over and done with. And, you know, that's how I just felt. So luckily I got in touch with Cape Communities Activities Projects in Ealing. Uh, I was referred to them. Had an amazing outreach worker, an amazing, amazing staff there, and this is basically how I got my life back on track. I wouldn't have anything to brush my teeth for anymore. So when they came to see me, she asked me, "How can I help you? How can the charity help you?" I go, "I want to get back to work. I know I'll feel a lot better if I get back to work." So that was the goal we set. So I started meeting up for coffee something to get out of the house for something to have a shower for something to brush my teeth for and i'll travel to go and have a coffee and just have a discussion about how they can help me and i started volunteering at the charity and so we did a list of this thing, my responsibilities at the charity what i do when i volunteer so it was just things like opening the blinds in the morning setting up the art table for art group in the morning doing a bit of administration work answering phone calls taking messages removing the art table in time for lunch then volunteering in the kitchen help preparing uh, freshly cooked meals for lunchtime for members clients of the charity and i started just doing two hours a day then went to three hours four hours and eventually i started doing full full days i did not try to get out of full days sometimes and leave early i was told i have to treat it like any other job would you say to your employee that you go to work for can you leave early no you'll have to stick it out for, till the end of the day so i was i was building my endurance up and i was out of bed for many hours a day and it got to the point where you know what i think i'm ready for work i think i'm ready for work an amazing outreach worker helped me so much transform my life at cape communities activities projects in ealing in acton and uh helped me with my job application had a look at my cv applied for the job and i'll tell you something like that if i didn't apply at primark i've been working at primark for five years now and i'm the number one cashier i'm on cashier one the first cashier and the in a busy department if it wasn't competent based interviews i don't think i would have got the job because i stumbled in the interview i forgot what i had to say but I, not all the time, just uh, I think one question I, I had a brain freeze. But every other question when they asked me, so tell me what, what have you done uh, and you know, how do you work part of the team? And I would refer to working in the catering in the charity. And this is how we worked as part of the team to prepare meals for people at a certain time and this number of clients and part, part, uh, uh, taking messages and uh, you know, for for members of staff and passing the messages and how we all worked as a team together taking clothes to the charity shop which is further down the road on a trolley so it was, it looked good that this is how I worked part of a team and had references from the charity that could vouch for me so you know it, it, volunteering really helped uh, immensely so much I really recommend volunteering if you're stuck in a rut but you know because it was competent based interview I got the job and I've been working there for five years and it's transformed my life I'm making music again I'm, I've got two shitheads my nephew and niece who I love dearly my cousin brothers you know and I'm writing songs and I've been holding and I just feel pleasant my, from what I've just explained to you wanting to jump in front of a train to now feeling pleasant inside and I want to say it's really a state of mind this is the most important thing I want to say I've got one minute left I'm going to try to keep it under ten minutes there's people who aren't so lucky. Now imagine being medicated for mental health, but it, the medication had a side effect. You didn't feel right. It gave you aches and pains, makes you nauseous. You're always vomiting. You got a headache. So the the psychiatrist has to try another medication. Then they put you take you off that medication and they put you on another one. That doesn't work. Then you gain weight. You balloon. That medication does. And you're going from cocktail of medication to medication, and it just your body malfunctions and you shut down. What do you think someone's going to do? To to get away from this mess that they've ended up they will jump in front of trains to end it all and get it over and done with quickly now no one deserves to die like that no one de deserves to die jumping in front of the train and i'm sure a lot of metropolitan cosmopol cosmopolitan uh, people that get the train to central london are fed up of it it delays their day somebody could go and see a loved one in hospital and then the train comes to a standstill but you have to understand it's, it's diminished, it's not selfish, it's diminished. They're in a diminished state of mind to get to that point where they just want to end it all. 
So it's not fair on someone with that sort of cocktail or medication to carry on like that. So I really believe once all options have been exhausted to help rebuild someone's life, when all options have been exhausted, we have to opt for assisted dying, assisted suicide, euthanasia from people with mental health in really extreme cases. No one deserves to die like that. We need to be more considerate.